everybody, Ben here for the Bonus Podcast, and it's time for an unbox and review. I think it would be fair to say that one of the hot topics of the year, being the 7th of January, is the Matched Play Guidebook that Games Workshop has produced. First of all, it's direct only, so it can only come from them. It's £10, which makes it probably the cheapest Blood Bowl product <laughs> made by Games Workshop. And it is 31 pages plus some very lovely pictures of how to run a Blood Bowl tournament. Now, for the last two decades, players have been doing Blood Bowl tournaments without the help of Games Workshop. A lot of that has come from working with the NAF, but there's also just been a lot of people running tournaments with no idea about the NAF or anything else. So this dropping and having some guidance on not just how to run a tournament, but how to structure the format of the tournament has been something that's been really interesting. There's a huge amount of people in the community that are like, this is a great idea. And there's a huge amount of people in the community who are saying that this is a terrible idea and Games Workshop can't do balance. So I think the best thing for us to do is to delve into the match play guide and see what it's really about. Okay, so we've got the book here. I'll do my best to show as much as I can on camera as we go. But like I said, um, it is 30, well, it's 31 pages of information. Uh, there we go, 31 plus some nice pictures. Now, I do like the way they do this. They add in people. That's really nicely painted, actually. They add in um, like the the teams, teams, which is really nice. It's good to see alternative paint schemes. You guys will know from the Spike magazines, you get one paint scheme and that's it. All right. Let's begin. So this is the match play guide, and this is a guide to Blood Bowl match play, which is really about tournaments. So let's zoom out a little bit and uh, see if we can't get a bit more of the pages. There we go. Okay, so first two pages are some cool teams. Uh, J. Claire is one of the, the lead rulers. Uh, <laughs> rulers? Games Workshop on the rule team here okay so contents uh this is what we got we got forward introduction code of conduct recommended tournament style tournament rules scoring tiebreakers pairings team draft list writing your roster skill points which was a huge one now we talked about this in a couple of videos last week super no mega stars and uh and skill points have been quite an interesting thing that's come out of this already um prayers to nuffle that'll be interesting uh, to see whether that's a slightly different a different list or whether it's just the d8 one um, awards, alternative formats, group and knockout events, knockout table wall chart, <laughs> which could be cool, uh, additional rules, and Blood Bowl events at Warhammer World, which I'm very interested about because we're going up to play sevens in a few months. So it will be interesting to see what the score is there. Anyway, we're not going to do the forward. Uh, recommended tournament style and tournament rules. So here we present you with our recommended tournament style, one that we believe will give all players the best experience and that has been extensively play tested. It covers all manner of things such as tournament rules, as you might expect, roles and responsibilities, scoring, tiebreakers and more. Now I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to go through and pick out some of the most important things. So you've got the event organizer, you've got referees, you've got scorekeepers. Now that mimics running a Blood Bowl tournament. In a lot of Blood Bowl tournaments, you know, 20 or less, that can all be the same person. Um, we've been there, we've done that, uh, we've been to events, um, especially up in Birmingham. Um, it used to be like 16 man tournaments or something like that. We'd go up there and it would just be one guy who was playing and scorekeeping and be the referee. And that was fine. That was fine for small events. Obviously, our bigger ones, you know, what we had for SCA 70, 80 players, we had uh, a team of two plus an odd man in. And then myself, who was doing coverage. So, the, you know, the more players you get going to a Blood Bowl event, the more kind of people you have around you. But the way they describe it here, so the scorekeeper is the person who puts the results into whatever you're using. You can use score, you can use a Google Sheet. I'm interested to see if there's anything in here about how to actually run it. <clears throat> okay, spare player, that would talk about that. Um, and the coach's responsibilities. This is nice. Now, we're very lucky, I think, in Blood Bowl. Most coaches come, like literally most coaches, if not all, come fully, fully prepared for the event. Getting your rosters in on time is always a challenge. And what, we've got three weeks, I think? Three weeks, four weeks, three weeks till, this, um, till Beachhead rosters are due. Um, <coughs> so get your rosters in now if you're coming. Uh, okay, tournament rules. All games at a Blood Bowl tournament will use the Blood Bowl rulebook. 
uh, any current supplements or spike journals, and the most recent versions of the FAQ, Arata, and Tier List, which can be found at the Warhammer community. All coaches are expected to abide by the following rules. Rules Pack. The event organizer should provide a rules pack for the event, uh, which will have all the essential information for the event um, in it, such as the venue, what time the event starts, round timings, detail about lunch, that is very important to halfling coaches, and any other important information about the day. It should also include the full details of what coaches should expect from the tournament itself, such as the budget of gold pieces the coaches have to use, what publications are in use, what tiebreakers are being used, and if there are any additional rules being used throughout the tournament. So what that means is, if you put a put together a rules pack, make it clear what's not being used, make it clear what your build is, and make it clear where your tiebreakers are, and also where there is food. And this is why we love doing it at the Entoyment. <coughs> they got QR codes on the flipping tables, so literally, you get hungry, you just scan it, and then Carl will bring you snacks and tea, which is why I love our tournament set in Toyment. Miniatures, here we go. This is something I think the community is a little bit apprehensive about, but will genuinely only apply in Games Workshop venues. Uh, coaches are expected to use only official Citadel and Forge World miniatures at the event, and all models must be fully built, based, and painted. Coaches must use appropriate miniatures for their team. Conversions are permitted. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, you may wish to ask any coaches wishing to use conversions to submit them to the event organizer for the event so they can check if they're happy with them. I mean... We get some great conversions and some great third-party stuff or 3D printed stuff. We provide 3D printed stuff, so not an issue. Good bit on conduct there uh, as well. So ties and score breaking. Uh, for tournament games, we recommend setting a time of limit of two and a half hours. Uh, yeah, I mean, most tournaments run between two and, and two and a half. We, I think, run with 2.15, but we budget for 2.30, really. We try and call it at two hours. We have a. We tend to run with slightly lower builds, though a little bit less skills and a little bit less gold to keep the games nice and easy. Because we want to make sure that if it's your first Blood Bowl tournament at one of our events, it's pretty chill um, and you get the the chance. Um, okay, so scoring points. They do it here: two points for a win, one point for a draw, and zero for a loss. <laughs> it is important that both coaches provide all the information, including the final score and number of casualties, um, at the end of the game. Yeah. And if you're filling out a tournament thing, make sure you're putting it on the right person and you've got your right name there or or uh, <laughs> or coach number or something. Um, so ranking, tiebreakers, one bonus point for three or more touchdowns, conceding zero touchdowns, bonus point like that, inflicting three or more casualties, one bonus point. Um, that's a little bit more stringent than I think most Blood Bowl tournaments run it. The, the interesting thing about Blood Bowl is every tournament, generally speaking, has its own rules pack, has its own build, and its own score system, which is not unlike the setting of Blood Bowl, right? Every In Blood Bowl, every tournament is run by it, its own um, like sponsors and advertisers, so every rule set in the tournament is slightly different. That's how Blood Bowl works in the Blood Bowl world. They've got the NAF to kind of provide that structure, but generally speaking, like there's the, you just go to a tournament and they have different rules. Is exactly how it is in Blood Bowl. Now, I love the idea of having a standard format for Blood Bowl, which I think this is going to move towards creating. But I love looking at a, a tournament pack and going, hmm, which, which team gets the boost here? Which team's got the best angle? What cool build can I make? What's the scoring system? Do you get plus one bonus point for each pass? Okay, well then now I'm definitely thinking about elves, that kind of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Rankings, we're not going to go through that. Pairings, round one. Uh, first round, coaches are paired together randomly. Um, if there's an odd number of coaches, the one coach will be randomly paired with a spare player or gain a buy. Buys are rubbish. Spare players, there we go, buys. Sometimes you'll be unable to find a suitable spare player for your event. In this case, in this case the coach that would be normally paired with the spare player, as described above, will receive a buy instead. Um which gets one bonus for tiebreakers and two, so it's okay. Conceding rules in there. Uh, even if your team is losing, it's good sportsmanship to continue to play to the very end of the game. Real-world sports teams don't quit the pitch, and they, <laughs> yeah, they don't. Sometimes they should. Should a player concede, their opponent will automatically win a three-win, a three-nil win, unless the score at the time of conceding was better, and will receive the maximum number of bonus points available. Additionally, the player who conceded will receive no bonus points whatsoever, and will also suffer a minus one tournament point penalty. So, uh, yeah, I mean that's what you expect to see. Uh, we've never had a concession in any of our events, um, which is pretty cool. So subsequent rounds. The coach who is highest in the ranking will play the coach who is second in the rankings. The coach in third, blah, 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 blah. 
Uh, if the coach is supposed to play an opponent they have already played, then the lowest ranked of the two will swap places with the highest ranked player at the pairing below them. Okay, so it's 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 uh, Swiss without the spreadsheet, which obviously makes me very sad. Um, okay, we've got team draft lists, lists here and your match document and permission to photocopy. Can you believe it? Writing your roster, drafting your team. Uh, this is just talking about match play stuff. I haven't seen any changes in this bit here. Uh, it says use the rules from 30 to 35 of the Blood Bowl rulebook. Uh, you have what the team budget is instead. Um, da, 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 da. That's fine. Inducements, you should list which are available, which are not available if something's banned. Star players may be included, but a team must include a minimum of 11 players as it is. Rob from the Isle of Wight looking at you and your crazy sand bowl builds. Um, <coughs> if both coaches have induced the same star player or member of infamous coaching staff, oh, they're allowing wizards, um, both coaches will still get to use them during the course of the match. And duplicates do not cancel each other out. Assume that one appearing on the losing team is an imposter or a long lost cousin. Or I think the old rules used to say wizards did it, which makes me very happy. Um, additionally, some event organizers may wish to add their own unique inducements to the event. If this is the case, they should be clearly listed in the rules pack, etc, etc. We do this. Uh, we normally give free inducements. We had free mascots at SCA for both 7s and 11s. Uh, we've got the Fen Beast as a star player inducement for Beachhead. It, it's just a cool way to add a little bit of extra theme, a little bit of extra flair. Now, this is the thing. So, this is the thing that everybody's been talking about, which is the skill points. So let's have a bit of a zoom in there. Hopefully it's clear enough. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So after you've drafted your team, you are able to give them some additional skills for the duration of the event. Coaches will select um, their skills based on the number of skill points they can spend depending on their tier. So tier 1 gets 6 points, tier 2 gets 8 points, tier 3 gets 10 points. The tiers of the teams are constantly being updated. They do that in the FAQ. We saw that in May last year, I think it was May. Might have been November of the year before, maybe. But where we've got Underworld and, and Orcs, which is an interesting one. A lot of people think Orcs should still be Tier 1. I don't really care. I think there's not a huge amount of difference between Tier 1 and Tier 2. Maybe a couple of skills in most tournaments. But actually, dropping a tier to incentivize the use of it. I'd rather have Orcs winning than Underworlds and, and Elves and things like that. Because, you know, Orcs, right? Okay, purchasing skills. This is the thing that we want to read. Purchasing a primary skill for a player will cost one skill point. There is no limit to the number of primary skills a team can purchase so long as they have skill points remaining. Purchasing a secondary skill for a player will cost two skill points. Teams are limited to the number of secondary skills based on their tier. A tier one team can have a maximum of one secondary skill on the team, etc, etc, etc. Each player can only be given a single additional skill, although there's no limit to the number of times that particular skill can be chosen. Well, Amazons are gone, so that Blodge Guard has kind of <laughs> been relegated to Dwarves now. And Dwarves at Tier 1 mean you're not getting a huge amount of skills. Uh, each player can only be given a single skill. Uh, additionally, star players cannot be given skills. It's important to note that unlike in League, skills purchased do not add value. All right, I like this. So far, everything here mirrors every Blood Bowl event, right? The way it's constructed, the way your roster's constructed... We're starting to split away now with the introduction of the skill points. And that's kind of the most interesting thing, I think, in this book. So star players. This, again, is another point of contention. So skill points must also be spent if a team wishes to induce a star player onto their team. If a team wishes to take a star player, they must pay the cost in gold pieces as described earlier and also spend two of their skill points on the team. Tier 1 teams may have a maximum of star one star player, while Tier 2 or 3 may have a maximum of two star players. So... Uh, that dwarf team we just mentioned can spend two of their skills to be allowed to buy a star player, basically. Some star players have such an impact on the game that they are classed as mega stars. Mega stars cost four skill points rather than the usual two skill points. Mega stars like to be the star of the show and don't like to have to share the limelight with anyone else. A team may only ever have a single mega star on their draft roster. Which star players are classed as megastars is changing, blah, 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 blah. Below is a table summarising the breakdown of what skill points can be spent on and some other examples of how different teams may spend them. Teams may still only ever have a maximum of two star players, including megastars. There we go. So that answers the question of can you take a megastar and a regular star? Yes, you can, assuming you're allowed. So tier two 
can take two star players, one of them can be a mega star, for four, five, six skill points and have two skills left over. Or one double if you want to. All right. Skill points example. Jay is taking a Wood Elf team to a tournament. As this is a tier one team, Jay has six skill points to spend. He decides to give one of his War Dancers Strip Ball. Yeah, fair enough. As a primary skill for one skill point and another ward answer sidestep as a primary skill for one skill point. He then gives his Lauren Forest Treeman grab for one skill point and one of his wood elves a line wrestle. Yeah, line wrestle one point. Spends his last two skill points to have Acorn the Squirrel as a star player. Alright, first of all, fun roster. Run in the tree man with a bit of grab. A couple of ward answers and acorn. Yeah, that's good fun. Alright. <laughs> so that answers the question of can you have a mega start and a regular start yes it can it just costs you more of your skill point allowance can't if you're a tier one team now the difficult thing here and one thing that we were kind of talking about in one of our earlier videos uh is can what about draw and dribble it very clearly in the rule book says uh that they take two star players so lizards and amazons <laughs> Can no longer take drawl and dribble i say no longer they just can't take drawl and dribble or grack and crumbleberry in a tournament event which is a bit of a shame now that is just for the games workshop rule set so any blood bowl tournament that you go to that says we're using the match play guide you can't run drawl and dribble in an, in an amazon in a lizard team or an amazon team which is a shame because actually i was looking forward to using drawl and dribble with amazons as like speed eight catchers i thought oh that could be really good uh not the case anymore but that's fine i'm sure they'll faq that at some point um yeah it's a tough one that's a tough one uh, i'm sure there's a couple of other ones that have been kind of um pointed out to uh to have been no goes now i suppose the swift twins but they're so flipping expensive you can barely ever afford the swift twins anyway uh prayers to nuffle treacherous trapdoor friends with the ref stiletto iron man knuckle dusters bad habits greasy cleats and blessed statue of nuffle this is the same as page 103 of the rule books that's good they've not changed that uh, Post-match, this is just kind of clarifying some rules. Um, interesting. I mean, dedicated fans doesn't do anything in a match play. After a match play game, the winning team increases the dedicated fans by one. Star player points. You don't get star player points, but record the amount of touchdowns each players make uh, for events where they have the most touchdowns by a single player. That is quite a cool thing, but... Oh, even for me, that's a lot of record keeping. Um, I think probably at smaller, like 20 man events, or if you're just playing with your club, then then yeah, I think that's pretty cool. I think at bigger events, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh, injuries, the same. Now, this is. Um, Okay, basically this section is saying that if anything is injured, it just goes back, right? This is, this is resurrection format. Acquiring additional players. Uh, so zombies and things they get they get gone after the end of a game because it's match play awards best way to do this uh, they've got some special awards here which I do quite like the look of we got uh, Griff Overworld's golden gloves for the team that scores the most touchdowns uh, Mighty Zug's wall of steel for the team that conceded the fewest touchdowns so we got most TDs uh, perfect defense Max Spleen Ripper's Carnage Cups for the team that inflicts the most casualties as a result of blitzing, blocking, or pushing oppositions into the crowd. Uh, Matron McGeary's Most Patch Up for the team that has had the most casualties. Okay, so most Kaz and then Chocolate Armor Award. Dirty Dan's Filthiest Git for the most players sent off as a result of committing fouls. And the Stunty Cup for the team uh, who places highest with Tier 3. All right, fair enough. I mean, it's up to you how you run your tournament and do the, your, your awards, uh, but I like that. All right, this is the fun bit. So that, that core stuff, with the exception of the skill points and the star players, which you know we've already kind of talked about in a different video. If you haven't seen that, go and have a look. But we'll be talking about it on the podcast this week as well, uh, on Wednesday night, live for patrons. And then um, it's, it's the format's not that bad. It, it seems fine. It seems pretty reasonable. This is, however, completely just... This is what Games Workshop actually excel at. These are the kind of ideas that we come up with as Blood Bowl players, right? Like, oh, a stunty tournament. Oh, team events. Like, this is stuff that's been happening for ages because it's fun. So actually, them putting it in the book is not a case of like, cool idea, bro. I'm going to steal that and put it in a book and charge you £10 to read your own idea. Maybe it is a little bit. But generally speaking, it's, it's to inspire people. 
because there's a lot of people who are getting into Blood Bowl now because they're going into a store or they're going to the Games Workshop website or they're going, oh, cool, Blood Bowl, I never played this, my community doesn't play this, no idea what the NAF is, I just don't know, don't care, just want to play a game. How else can we play a game? Oh, cool, I've got this book, I want to run an event for my local club, for my local league, you know, and now it's given me some other ideas. So the Stunty Tournament is just... Um, teams with stunty so uh, a stunty tournament follows the standard rules a stunty team is any team that can be made up entirely of players with the stunty trait or big guys which is the colloquial term for larger players in the game this may result in teams you wouldn't expect being allowed to participate in a stunty tournament providing they follow these rules the following teams are eligible black orcs with only trolls and bruisers goblins halflings lizardmen uh, with no sauruses ogres snotlings underworld with only goblins, snotlings, trolls, and rat ogres. All right, fair enough. That makes a lot of sense. Um, stunty tournaments typically a more relaxed style of event. Yeah, stunties, stunty only is a really fun way of doing it. Team events are pretty cool. Team event tiebreakers, team event pairings. I like that they've gone into the detail of that. Um, team events are quite challenging to run. We did one in Portsmouth with two teams, Fobble versus Wobble, two different clubs. Uh, it was really good, really good fun, really good fun. Full on, but really good fun. Right, group and knockout events. Another alternative format event organisers may wish to look at is one that combines a group stage with a knockout stage, much like real-world sports competitions. Very appropriate as we're going into the playoffs in the NFL at the moment, which is incredibly knockout. Um, group stage... Da, 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 da. Groups of four. Then the first three games of the event are played as a round robin, with each team playing each other, and then they go forward. So it's just basically describing sports which is fine because you know sports and then they go through to this point here so the uh, the top two teams i think of the group stages go on and play each other in the quarterfinals and then they go on through and you've got a nice little table chart here which again does nothing for us but it's going to inspire a whole bunch of people uh, i remember reading the second edition rule book and reading about like the naf championships and all this kind of stuff and um I was like, oh man, the Dark Side Cowboys scored so many touchdowns at this point. It was just, it was just really cool to see. Uh, additional rules, injuries. Uh, da, 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 if a dis right, um, yeah, okay. This is just the additional rules section. So you can have injuries in your thing. You can have player advancement in your thing. You can have custom inducements. Um, here we go. We've got some custom inducements here. Dwarven Smith. Let's let's try this guy out. Let's have a quick look at this. A Blood Bowl tournament is the ideal place for the local Smiths to showcase their talents and sell their wares. Uh, many coaches are quick to purchase some extra Dwarven Steel to protect their more vulnerable players or provide their heavy hitters with extra edge they need. Um, before the game begins, a team that has hired a Dwarven Smith for 100 gold pieces available to any team must roll a d6. On a 1-3, to three, the Dwarven Smith has provided the team with some additional armor plating. Choose d3 players and improve their armor by one till the end of the game. On a four to six, the Dwarven Smith has provided the team with a selection of knuckle dusters, uh, boots, etc. D3 players on the team game mighty blow instead. Okay, that's fine. So again, it's that thematic thing. Festive gifts, booby-trapped end zone. That's, that's brutal, actually. I don't know if I like that. Um, for the duration of the game, so this is a 100k inducement. For the duration of the game, whenever an opposition player with the ball moves into a square in your end zone, they must roll a d6. On a 2 plus, nothing happens. On a 1, uh, the opposition is knocked down and no touchdown has scored. So that's quite an interesting one. They've gone that, that. You've got buffets, and this is the thing I really do like. I, I, I love all the extra rules they put in these rules, in these books. That they do nothing except inspire, and that's just an awesome place to be. Um, some events may decide to change the team draft budget in between games, showcasing the increased investment of team's owners over the course of a tournament. Uh, this means that coaches will start a smaller team draft budget for the first game and will increase, uh, for example, 1 million, then 1.1, then 1.2. Um, it talks a little bit about that that's fine mandatory star players again sandball secret objectives is quite interesting and again this is just cool extra real rules which you're never going to use um one additional rule that can be provided to other unique event experiences is the use of secret objectives these are a selection of hidden agendas da -da -da -da, uh, used as tiebreakers 
There are 16. At the start of the game, each coach should roll for three secret objectives and make a note of them, re-rolling any results they have already rolled for this game. The three secret objectives are that are rolled are what the coach must try and achieve over the course of the game, and each coach should write them down and place them by the side of the pitch to be revealed at the end of the game. Um, yeah, fine. Dubious. Could be gamed. Right. Uh, secret objective. Red card. Have a player on your team sent off. Didn't need them anyway. Finish a half with at least one reroll unused. Going alone. Have a player on your team knock down an opposition player without having any offensive assists. Okay. Inflict a casualty. That is kind of like the 40k and AOS extra, um, extra, <laughs> extra. Pa so I watch uh, the 40k stream um, from War Games Live, and they always do this this like secondary objectives thing, and the secondary objectives are always chosen based on your team. That could be quite a fun way to do it. I would just have a tournament where you place a bounty on the opponent's highest TV player or lowest TV player and you get an extra touchdown's worth of points if you get that. I don't know. There's a lot of things you can do. And that's this is all just to inspire you to come up with your own stuff. Okay, Blood Bowl events at Warhammer World. Blood Bowl is incredibly popular here at the ancestral home of Warhammer World. In fact, it's hard to walk through the gaming hall da -da -da, without playing Blood Bowl. Yeah, right. Cool. That's just... That's just gone. Um, they've got events and things like that. Players attending events must follow. That, that says absolutely nothing at all. All right. Okay. So that is the match playbook. Um, the impact of the match playbook is going to be a very, I think, different topic. Uh, because it's going to be very much along the lines of how many tournaments are going to be using this. Quite frankly, any tournament using this is fine. The, the match playbook points the skill points is just fine in fact it may even be easier to understand than a lot of now we used to do touchdown no no it used to be tournament tuesday right where we'd look at different tournament rule sets and we'd try and brew up a roster but some of the rule sets were just really poorly written really poorly planned out or really confusing i know i made a joke about gold bars and things which is fine when you understand it but as a new player coming in this gives you choices, it gives you builds, and it gives you kind of a really reasonable starting point. And if you look at this compared to most Blood Bowl tournaments, um, you're going to end up with a very similar amount. Um, there were some great comments in the video the other day, though, about star players that are overpowered and whether you just increase the cost. Increasing the cost seems very fair, but you'll end up with them just never being used at that point, or actually this is a reasonable way of doing it i think it's, it's a good middle ground uh, and i know there's a ton of you out there that are like three tiers are not enough but quite frankly five tiers are not enough every team should have its own index based on how they are performing and you should get a little bit more gold or a little bit more based on that it, to be to add an element of balance but actually chunking them into three tiers which is tier one which is that's a good team already tier two which is a fun team but a good team with skills and tier three which is a fun team but won't win anything and very often is how Blood Bowl operates. There are some good tier 2 teams and there are some worse tier 1 teams. But that's just how Blood Bowl is. And this at least gets you in, lines up with the actual rules for Blood Bowl and is a really good entry point. And I personally would have no problem playing in a tournament that used the match play guide as a standard format for Blood Bowl. I like the World Cup rules for the World Cup and this is very similar in a lot of ways. A little bit more simple a little bit less curated, a little less honed, but as a starting point, I think they've done a really good job here. And we'll see this at some tournaments. Uh, there'll be some younger tournaments starting up using the match play guide. That's cool. You get to use a bunch of stuff. You get to play Blood Bowl with the models you like. You get to play games that are not broken. Star players are honed down a little bit. If this is the future of Blood Bowl tournaments, it's fine. The way we're all doing it is much better, and I love that. And that is never going to stop, which is awesome, because it's just never going to stop. We're always going to run our tournaments the way we run them. You know, I know you are as well, and that's perfect. And there'll be tournaments out there with five, six tiers. And like I said, gold bars, dime bars, chocolate bars uh, to balance out your skills. And that's fine too, because Blood Bowl is flexible in that way, because at a core... It's quite a simple starting point, and the match play guide fits into that really well, and I love it. Is this required by anybody running a tournament? Absolutely not. Not at all. Don't buy it. There's really not much point. But if you have bought it, you're going to enjoy reading some of the alternative formats, some of the alternative rules. Uh, but I think 
if you like that kind of thing, writing your own is going to be even more fun for you. So the match play guide is there. It's not a bad start. It's a good start. Anyway, I'm going to wrap up. Let me know what you think. Let me know your fears and tears because I'm interested to see. And we'll be back soon with more Blood Bowl content. Happy tournamenting. Thanks very much for watching. We really appreciate your support. If you want to support the channel even further, please like and subscribe. It really does help us out. Or come join us on YouTube members or in Patreon where you can get exclusive access to some content, some loot, early access to basically everything we do as well as regular competitions. Or you can pick up some Bonehead Podcast loot either on our website at boneheadpodcast.com. We've got the Dungeon Bowl things. We've got tokens and stuff like that. Or on our Spreadshirt site as well. Everything you do just helps us make more content and hopefully do it of better quality. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Happy blocking.